Hello, it's me. I was wondering if after all the years you like to me to go over all the things. Welcome to the show. This is the Goodwin Podcast, and I'm Nico, your host. And let's start with a question, a little bit of self-analysis. How hard are you peeing? Particularly, this is for the gentleman. But how, how hard are you peeing? When you pee, are you pushing with all your might? For the for the ladies, I'm sure this is. I'm sure ladies can push too. When you're when you're pooping, are you in it for the efficient? Are you in it? Is it a speed round? I realized that I had a revelation, and this wasn't particularly recent, but I keep re relearning and remembering the revelation. I realized that I was always peeing with all my might and pooping for speed. And the revelation happened in a porta potty in Thailand after I drank a large mushroom shake. And I became enlightened. I became enlightened in a porta potty in uh, in Thailand on mushrooms, just for a moment. Clearly, it didn't last forever. But I realized I was just. It was kind of two revelations wrapped up in one. The first revelation was the porta potty was so gross, but knowing that I could open the door and leave. I think the revelation was, oh, this isn't always how life is. Life isn't always an overused, grungy porta potty baking in the hot sun. And that was an, that was my that was a moment of enlightenment. Oh, life isn't always a sweaty box of mine and other people's excrement. That's good. Why is it that there is some... Is is enlightenment bound to suffering? Or is this life that we live just... Is suffering baked in pain is baked in and and then it's just that's what's needed to be overcome for this joy I guess so because any denial of the of the the dual nature that we've been given is probably off the mark probably closer to spiritual bypassing so how hard are you peeing you know So after that enlightenment, I realized, oh, I can just let the pee fall out of me and let gravity do its work. I don't even have to push. I can just wait until I have to go and it'll fall out like a gentle rain splashing in the puddle. Of the toilet. Ugh. So I forget all the time. You know, I'm in a hurry. And, uh, or I want to sound cool in, in the men's bathroom. So there's two types of men in the world there's men that, 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 
pee directly into the belly of the water to create the deepest resonant sound for those around them. And then there's men who pee on the side of the bowl to minimize the sound of their pee. And though I've, I've been both at various times, I, I've tended to be the guy who pees on the side. Not to make any, any disturbances or waves. At a time, I'm like, it's toxic masculinity. To pee full, to pee full force, just to make a deep resonant sound. Oh, and then how embarrassing is it that, you know, you go for it, you, you try to pee the largest sound, the most forceful sound you can, and then it's just a, it's just a five to ten second pee. Because it's not just the deepness of the sound that's, that, 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 uh, that's appealing to men that establishes your dominance, but it's also the length of your pee. So are you going to sacrifice, you know, length of your pee for intensity of sound? Is that the kind of person you are? Are you just going to, are you going to, you know, not play the game at all and just pee on the side of the bowl? You're not going to, you're too good for that game. You're too good to play the, the pee loudness game. more likely you're somewhere in the middle you you try to create a, a strong stream that you're able to sustain over time so you check both boxes in male in the dominance and, and really establish your dominance in the bathroom or maybe you're you're just a rebel and you and it's and it's funny to you maybe you're a comedian and you just dribble out you know, you sustain a pee, maybe a 10, 20 minute pee, that's, that's dribbles. You dribble out a 10, 20 minute pee. And in a way, that's dominant. So what kind of person are you, you know? And really, what, are, what kind of person are you when you are using your own bathroom and no one can hear your streams? No one can hear your kerplunks. Your plops. Is there a way to slow down? Is there any benefit to slowing down? I, I keep feel like I, I keep relearning the lesson. Hey, slow down. Hey. Hey. Why are you going so fast all the times? And usually how I'm peeing and how I'm kerplunking is is a is just as good of an indicator as any to see the the speed in which I'm operating in. The mental speed. And what I think I like is a calm but a lot awake, calm but focused. And what I usually settle for is stress and focused. I find I, I perform better, even in the performance of life in this grand act, with that uh, level of calm and focus. Still, but ready to move quickly. I had a like this, this affects, it's a good way to look at sports, I think, too. And though I don't have a prestigious resume of sports, I've had success. You know, I, you know, I've really been a gym class hero. I feel like my best sports moments are uh, practicing. I'm one of those, those athletes that... Uh, I might be the best in practice some days. 
and even though I haven't really performed on the stage of sports in a while, um, and I've overcome this a little bit, but uh, this, the stage used to used to ruin my game, got to my head. Yeah, stage fright was real for me. And I, this is this is a, probably the best example. I was on a, a vacation with my family, and we went and saw a magician. Who? We went and saw a magician, and I was invited on stage with another young with another young boy. We were boys at the time. 10, 11, 12. And the magician pulled out a sword and he was going to stick it through the other boy's neck and he wanted me to hold a Band-Aid, a really large Band-Aid. It's part of the show, probably some sort of distraction for, for the... Uh... And he gave me the Band-Aid and he, and he pulled out the sword and I dropped the Band-Aid and ran off the stage mid-show. It's too overwhelming. Or I flash back even a little bit more. I used to cry getting people singing happy birthday to me just because just from the sheer attention. So I'm peeing a lot softer these days, or, or rather, I'm just, I'm trying to allow pee to be, I'm allowing pee to be peeing, you know, and what reminded me of this was I was, you know, I was forcefully, I'm just moving so fast, just moving so fast. Is it a product of society? I drink coffee. I still like that. As far as addictions go, there was probably the, the past decade has been cannabis, coffee, yeah, those are prop those are sugar. Those are probably the three addictions that I've I've worked with most closely. Maybe maybe sex, fantasy, pornography, things can, that can be put in there. Um, particularly mental fantasy, not not so much pornography. And and now I've I've actually stepped away from cannabis, and uh, I w- there's something it just happens, like. Changing my actions, changing my mind, breaking free of addiction, it's something that just happens. I'll, I'll think about it for years. I'll shame myself for years. I think during a particularly manic time, I remember writing in my journal, like I was in detention class, um, <laughs> all the manifestors are going to be mad at me because I'm I may have done the opposite, but I I remember writing, I do not smoke or drink. I do not smoke or drink. Now, clearly, the emphasis is on smoking and drinking. And there's that theory that your subconscious doesn't process any negative. So when I say I do not smoke or drink, it's the subconscious hears smoke and drink. Do smoke, drink. Because the energy is still there. Uh, It would be more... According to the manifestors, it would be more uh, effective to be like, I practice sobriety every day. I practice sobriety every day. And you write that out through repetition. But the point is, is I, I, I used to really be down on myself, quite a bit of shame for, um, uh, for, for doing that. And... And no matter how much I'd get down on myself, it never seemed to change. And then there just comes a day. It doesn't even have to be a special day. Um, And I just 
decide not to smoke that day. And then the next day, uh, it's you know I decide not to smoke that day. And the next day, and the next day, and and there's just an ease to it. It's just a reminder not to rush like any process. And I, and I wonder if that shame and that wanting to change, desperately wanting to do something different or, or getting down on myself, that might be necessary. I'm not even trying to take that away. Uh, but in a way I am because I think you can program the goal without shame and then just kind of release it and then the day will come where it just becomes easy to fulfill. You know, I, no evidence, not scientific, but I wonder if part of the reason I got sick is is um, these habits along with how I felt about doing these habits. I felt like I was doing the wrong thing while I was doing it. And what kind of way to live is that? So I don't, I don't think it's important to rush. Um, I think more what the world, this world particularly needs is actually a little bit more gent- ease, self-ease, self-gentleness. I know so many people that are hard on themselves. I, and it's, it's easy for me to see because, you know, that's, it's quite a clear reflection of myself. Part of and part of the journey, particularly with cannabis, has been, you know, I really allowed myself to go fully into it. As soon as I started dropping the shame, uh, I smoked, you know, a even more, a bunch more. But it was shame free, and I did that for another few months, even though I still knew in the back of my mind, I'm like, I eventually just want to stop smoking. It's nothing against cannabis at all nothing against uh, anyone changing, you know, having sovereignty over their consciousness. So important. Um, But something about smoking, it's just like, okay, how I'm doing it is affecting my jujitsu practice. I'm getting winded. You know, I'm I'm running and uh, getting winded right away. And I I don't like that feeling anymore. So I, I use some edibles here and there still. Um, but actually now I'm at this point where like I'm valuing sobriety in a way uh, that I hadn't before. Uh, minus coffee. So coffee is my last uh, hook. I mean, I still get down with sugar. Sometimes. There's no rush, and that's why uh, I don't I don't pee with all my might anymore. That's why I don't poop with all my might anymore. Cause it's a simple practice to to slow, to calm. Maybe not slow. Maybe it falls out fast like a waterfall. There is something about about that sloth energy. The sloths get a bad rap because it's like one of the seven, seven deadly sins, right? Sloth, greed, envy, lust, gluttony, wrath. I think that's seven. And sleep being a cousin of death, you know, like one of the lessons from cancer was, do I really want to be here? And do my actions prove that I want to be here? Like it was, it was just too easy to, to not show up for myself, to not do show up for the things I actually want to do. And in that way, sloth was 
just you know keeping me in that in death and how can i create and celebrate life a little bit more so that i can cultivate life in myself because i i do want to be here now more than ever but sloth medicine is good if you have you never seen a sloth if you've never been around a sloth they're as advertised when you touch a sloth everything about them is uncomfortable pretty much their hair is coarser than it's it's just like it's almost like between porcupine and horse hair in coarseness just super coarse they look they look so stupid they just look so stupid and that's what's endearing about them as well and they're stiff their 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 whole body is like what's it compared to it's just so stiff it's like a penis at 3 quarters their whole body very little bend like how did they make it how did sloths how do sloths make it in this world probably they're probably not that appetizing there's no tenderness to the meat but i don't think that would stop certain like komodo dragons or wherever they live whatever their predators are tigers but that beautiful sloth medicine is moving just a little slower just so that my eyes have a chance to really take in what i'm seeing the world maybe you've had this experience maybe you've driven a particular route for many years or something you've driven to school and uh and one day you decide to ride your bike and you start seeing all these things that you've driven by for years that you've never seen before and then this that you decide to walk maybe one day and you see things that you weren't even able to see on your bike and how much am i doing that you know there's so much speed um in this world so i think that's that's the exact reason bringing gentleness to yourself and that sloth medicine has been um been particularly important And so I let my pee fall out uh at, at the rate of gravity 9.8 meters per second. I think that's it. And what is that? What is what is peeing hard? Like it doesn't mean you have a big penis if you pee w- deeply. In fact, maybe if you had a shorter penis then the p has to travel farther and it can gain more momentum and create a larger sound it's like when you're sitting on the toilet and you're peeing uh it doesn't you know create the resonance from from standing so it doesn't i don't get that big dig vi- no and actually i've never even listened to other people's streams and judged it and yet I, i've still been in the position where i'm trying to pee with base what is that yeah how i that dude pees pees really hard i want to i want to respect him i want to listen to the things that he he tells me i wasn't going to I wasn't going to listen I wasn't going to give that that man respect or attention um undivided attention but then I heard him pee bro that man pees so hard I want I want to enter an organization with that that man and let him um and let him 
uh, be my, you know, be my commander. And I wasn't, I wasn't, I mean, he wears Junko jeans, um, very unassuming, uh, paints his fingernails, uh, in a color that I'm, that I, that I don't like personally. Um, but I heard him pee, bro, and this joke's going nowhere. I just, I just don't get it. Why my, my mind would do something like that. Where's the evolutionary, what would an evolutionary bi- biologist say? Well, I, you know, it would scare off predators. You'd have a greater chance of survival if you if you're able to pee hard. Because a tiger would hear it and be like, "Not today." Whew. That sounds like a really small creek, like the smallest creek possible, and I don't I don't want to have anything to do with that. A tiger would say after hearing someone forcefully pee. And it can't be that good for you. I mean, your urethra... Whatever. I don't want to speculate on that. Something I do want to clear up, not clear up, but uh, expound upon is... So I've talked about retaining semen. And it is an Eastern Chinese um, Taoist practice. And... In my research and in my in my googling, actually, I use Ecosia. Apparently, Ecosia is a search engine that helps plant trees. So, I choose them. So I Ecosia it, and the first thing that came up is men who ejaculate twenty one times a month may have a redu- a reduced risk of prostate cancer. I'm like, oh damn. What I've been reading and what I've been sharing on this podcast is about people retaining their semen. I don't want to believe this. I have to re- do do a little more research. So I did. I looked at the article published, which was a single article that gained popularity. Probably because it reinforced people's masturbation habits and anything that'll give you confirmation bias, uh, I'm more likely to accept. Um, and anything that, that doesn't agree with me, I'm more likely to reject. So I'm still, I still have biases here because I still think that there's psychological, energetic benefits of choosing where your semen goes, where your creative juice goes. So that's my bias that I'm working with. Um, so I looked at this article, and you know it said may reduce. And and how they did this this test was they interviewed thirty two thousand men. That's a lot. That's a lot of men. N is significant. Sample size is significant. So that can't be the issue. That can't be where I can pick apart this this uh, hypothesis. And how they did it was they interviewed men in um, I forget the exact years. Let's let's say it was 1990, and then they interviewed the same men in 2006, asking them their masturbation habits or their ejaculation habits, and then seeing which ones developed prostate cancer and they found a correlation that men who masturbated 21 times or more in a month also were in the group of men that didn't have as much prostate cancer now the fallacies in this lie in a few a few ways in my mind one, it doesn't distinguish between masturbation and sex, sexual ejaculation. I think there is a difference. I think there's an exchange in fluids that happens with sex that can't happen in masturbation. 
Um, so that's just to note. That's just a note. Two, these are interviews happening 15 years, 16 years apart. And to rely on the memory, it just doesn't seem that specific. Like a man's masturbation, um, tat like frequency can change in 16 years. It probably does, depending on their stress or what they got going on in their life. And it doesn't, yeah, to, like if you ask me how often I masturbated in the past 16 years, and you ask me to give you a ballpark answer, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't give it, be able to give you accurate data. I, I might skew it one either way. Depend. So it it's depending on interviews of men, not consistent recording. It doesn't distinguish between the type of ejaculation. Um, and there was another. Another oh and and it doesn't uh, have any other contributing factors that might lead uh, like diet like type of exercise um, nothing it, it was it was strictly correlating ejaculation and prostate cancer and to not factor in anything else lifestyle any lifestyle factors it just it doesn't seem that strong now. There's also no science to back up uh, the Taoist approach of retaining, but in my personal experience more recently, again, empowered by what I'm choosing to believe, I've been proud of myself. I've built, I've built a little self-esteem knowing that I can actually retain and the need to, to ejaculate or orgasm isn't as strong where that it will overtake my life like it's nice to know that i can control it a little bit more um and i have felt energized but that's also correlated with you know smoking less um and revisiting certain dietary things i'm, I'm consuming um more nutritious foods i've cut out vegetable oils of all kinds um so there's a lot of contributing factors. But the one thing I can point to, and that's very hard to measure, is the self-esteem, the self-worth, the sense of discipline that I feel like I'm cultivating with retention. And so my message now is revised. My revised message is, it's your life. See how it feels for you. If you haven't tried one or one side or the other, if you've maybe for instance you've been retaining for years, maybe try a, a couple weeks of masturbating a couple like three or four times a week. Take notes. You can always go back. Keep the experiment going. Don't settle on your hypothesis, especially because your body's changing. And on the flip side. If you masturbate every single day to the point of ejaculating, then give the discipline thing a try. Give the retention thing a go. And again, to reiterate, I think retention with intimacy, with arousal, I'm not saying stop arousing yourself and i'm not saying stop being sexual because i think arousal is still really important and it's kind of important to stoke that fire ever so often because arousal is associated with oxytocin with serotonin and i like arousing myself now without releasing you know building up the fire a little bit and then letting it burn and kind of letting it burn out at its own course instead of just kind of like dumping water on it or whatever, or just extinguishing it. So I, th I still think even if you're going to stop ejaculating to keep 
arousal in your life somehow. Hopefully you have a trusted ally to practice arousal with and sexuality that doesn't have to be penetrative or orgasmic or it can be penetrative but it doesn't have to be orgasmic um, or ejaculatory so that's something I wanted to clear up a little bit that there is counter evidence there seems to be counter evidence for almost every hypothesis <laughs> so it really does come down to what what you I choose to move forward with. And it's hard to know where choices come from. I kind of like this concept of um, of the body has many brains, quote unquote brains. Of course, it has one like anatomically labeled brain, but the consciousness of different chakras, for example, like Vipassana, which I made a, I made a video on uh, OnlyFans and Patreon talking about Vipassana experience and also going through a bit of the techniques. So if you're interested in learning some Vipassana meditation techniques, uh, please check that out. Um, and part of the Vipassana technique is bringing your consciousness to different parts of the body and simply observing the sensation at various points of your body with equanimity, without judging, without judgment. So the times I can catch myself, my mind going, and being, I'm being mind dominant for too long, I'll just interrupt that pattern by bringing my awareness to my chest to where my heart is and maybe i'll listen to my i'll i'll feel my heartbeat for a while and i'll i'll try to hold my consciousness there and still move throughout the day and it almost it almost empowers the action in a different way it could be the same action but with a with a different uh, flavor and likewise I'll bring the my awareness to my belly my stomach or, or to my genitals you know especially if my mind is getting like really into fantasy about being with sleeping with people or craving touch or sexuality I'll bring my consciousness to my genitals intentionally and just kind of like feel in um, seems to help the mind chatter, at least. I don't know if it has other other consequences or. So after after a vipassana retreat, so that was a ten day silent retreat. Um, we practiced the technique four to six times a day for an hour hour increments completely in silence for the 10 days and I did uh, I got done with that and I did an ayahuasca ceremony shortly after and the first few hours of the ayahuasca ceremony I would do the vipassana technique I was shown and I would take I was really taking my time because there's no rush like I know I'll be sitting in ceremony for a few hours at least so moving very slowly throughout my body, uh, scanning my body, really going into different parts of it. And what exactly? I got to my genitals and I, I rested my attention on my genitals. And as soon as I did that, someone started moaning from across the room in exact synchronization as when I was, and I was like, whoa. Why did that happen? Is it important why it happened? Can they feel me? And in these ceremonies, that sense of self and the dissolving of the boundaries, hmm, I don't know how to measure it. I don't know how real it is, but it there's just seems to be evidence on evidence through personal experience that these boundaries are dissolved. And it makes me think that the boundaries are less real even in sober life even in regular waking life and that the ayahuasca or the 
the plant medicine, the hallucinogenic drug, um, just helps me become aware of that matrix or that network uh, that exists between us and helps me like see it with like, so, like it's become self-evident, evidence to myself. That's almost impossible to prove still. I wonder, I wonder if I can set that intention to kind of make a measurable, um, that would be scientifically respected or verified maybe in hundreds of years or whenever people are ready to accept it. I wonder if there is a measurable, if you can measure connection, measure love, or um, I think people, some people like claim they can measure auras, and I, I think you can measure polarity, magnetic polarity that exists beyond the body, or electromagnetic um, frequency. I think that is actually measurable. And that would be kind of cool to have like a voltometer to to play with to kind of see how real it is, like see the density of the measurement. Um, Cause it's hard for me to kind of like, I, I, I need a logical appeal. I can't just be told, yeah, your aura extends or I can see your aura is green today. Cool. Maybe your filter, maybe your sun, your, your third eye is wearing green sunglasses though. It's hard to know. And that, that also makes me think about astrology, like, the f energy of Mars, the position of Mars, position of any of the planets, and how that affects me. It has to be such a subtle level, because like, why would Mars or Pluto, so far away, relatively small, why would that affect me more than this tree right outside my window? Like, I know it's much larger than this tree, but this tree is so much closer. And there's many trees. The earth is way closer. So how can any planet that's that much further away, regardless of its size? Now, Jupiter, it pulls, because it's so much larger, it pulls asteroids away from earth. It's actually kind of like a protector. But how that affects, like my day to day, it's still I still need clarity on that. <clears throat> but I I kind of like to do this. I I give it. I play within. Like I'll still listen to any astrologer. I'll still look at a birth chart and let and listen to what someone has to tell me about it. Um, and I like that. I actually enjoy it. But also not getting too wrapped up in it and still needing a logical appeal to move forward. Um, does that make me non-committal, I wonder? Maybe. So I'm a Leo, so that's my sun sign. Don't know, I don't know my rising signs. But if someone wants to look it up, it's July 31st, 1989. I was born around 9 a.m. in Evanston, Illinois. And I just can't recall my star charts and all my signs because I haven't been given that logical appeal to, I guess, retain the information. It hasn't been hmm, clear enough, crystallized enough. Which brings me to crystals. No, I'm not going to talk about crystals. Crystals are beautiful and um, the mind is really powerful and this, you are really powerful and this world is strange and it's full of mystery. So if that crystal to you makes you feel a sense of self or love, then it's working. And I would, I do not want to take that away. Um, yet. So 
So how are you peeing today? How are you going to pee moving forward? Forceful flush? Maybe. Powerful poop? Perhaps. But if you haven't tried just letting it fall, letting it all fall out, give it a go. Give it a go. Give it a solid or liquid effort. Thank you so much for being here. This has been The Good Wind. Goodbye.